Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is, hold on, let me check to see what date it is. Today is Tuesday, July 11th, 2023. It is the Open Search Community Meeting. Thanks for swinging by. And we have got Canonical here with us uh, for some great stuff. But first, uh, as usual, I always have to go through the etiquette and uh, general behavior guidelines. Uh, introduce yourself before speaking. Please mute unless you're actively speaking. Cameras are, of course, optional. And uh, questions anytime in chat or audio, although if we have a presenter and they have a preference, uh, you know, make your preference known and we will accommodate. Uh, disruptive people will be removed. Uh, no screen annotations, profiles only show names. Only hosts or co-hosts can share their screen. And of course you typed in a passcode and no one will be able to change their name once they join. And announcements, we have got a handful. I might need some people to elaborate on some of this stuff. I'm just coming back from vacation. And I spent the last five minutes trying to find a dad joke for everybody here, but uh, we'll see about the one I picked. Uh, CFPs are closed for OpenSearchCon. Uh, and they're going through a review process. And I think we're, uh, David, do you know how close we are to notifying our uh, winners? So we have set the date Wednesday morning. Uh, final decisions should be done. We have the list. We are just running it by to make sure we've not missed anything, making a list, checking it twice. So tomorrow morning, I should start sending announcements. Awesome. Uh, let's see. I think I saw Aparna join, but I know, uh, I'm not sure if this is, uh, Aparna, is this your thing here, the uh, user research on AI assistant for dashboards? Yes, it is. Thanks, Nate. Uh, I have joined. I do have a weak connection, so I do apologize. I uh, just want to make this announcement that uh, Nitin, one of our PMs, uh, who is working to help uh, with uh, some dashboard enhancements, uh, and myself are conducting uh, research with our community members. This is very exploratory. And we are looking for participants who can provide insights on um, AI assistance, especially when it comes to dashboards. So if you feel uh, you have some um, thoughts to provide as a dashboard user and how you might use an AI assistant on a dashboard, uh, please uh, send an email either to apasun at amazon.com or opensearchresearch at amazon.com. And there is a forum post as well. So uh, for folks who are here, if you would love to um, talk to us, we'd love to talk to you if you'd want to talk to us. Um, and so just, just uh, send us an email and we'll set time up. And that is happening this week and then the following week as well. We might extend it into the third week just a little bit, but uh, we're hoping to um, get your insights and also of course share it with the community when we're done with the research. Thanks, Nate. You bet. Uh, Aparna is a, a prime example of the benefit of having a cognitive scientist on your team. Uh, so I appreciate all the good feedback we get from these. Uh, release meeting. Looks like we have a new public meeting for 2.9. Is that correct? That is correct. We have a series going. We'll go through each phase of a, of a open search release. This is the first time we're doing it. There's a link here in the chat. It shows the series and all the dates. And so if you're interested, join us. Awesome. Brainstorm about open search and generative AI event. That sure sounds awesome. I'm sorry I don't have more descriptive. That's the whole description for now. It's going to be a brainstorming session. Everyone, we had someone from the community reach out and want to do a brainstorming session about generative AI with, with everyone involved with open search. So it should be a just really an open forum, not really a big agenda other than let's have a discussion. Nice. Well, that's all we really do here too. So uh, they've, they've hit the bar. <laughs> and of course, it uh, looks like dev meetings are going public. Yet another way we're taking our uh, decision-making process into the public eye. Now, those should be listed on our events page. And David, you have a streaming series, I think. Do you have a link to that you could share with the group? 
post a link. I have to find it. But yes, I'm going to be live streaming, talking about all things open search, currently working with the JavaScript client. But um, also, I'm, I'm about to do a live stream probably in the next week or two about LLMs and vector databases. Um, and it's going to be super controversial. So make sure to attend every Wednesday at 2.30 Eastern. So I'll Thanks. drop a link. Yep. Watch chat for a link to that. You won't want to miss it. Yeah. That's David, Mr. Controversial. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Sometimes. Awesome. So like I said, uh, Canonical is here to uh, share with us some of their uh, Snap, uh, Snap Charm technology uh, that will launch up OpenSearch and... Uh, Looks like we have a you have one for OCI uh, OCI container image, uh, so all, those will be uh, our uh, main guests today. I guess uh, if no one has anything for the good of the order, I will hand it over to Canonical. Make sure to introduce yourselves. Big round of virtual applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David, Nate, Chris, Patty, for organizing this. We appreciate it a lot. There we go. Yes, so we can quickly introduce ourselves. So I'm Michelle, I'm product manager at Canonical, mainly for open search. And I'm very happy to introduce, give a bit of introduction about what we're doing here and uh, what is this open source project we are, we've been working on at Canonical. So uh, the title is Open Search Everywhere, Trusted, Secure, Dev Developer-Friendly Snaps and Rocks. And before we deep dive to this specific topic, I have the next slide, which is you know just a bit of greetings from us at Canonical. I think there's quite a lot of people here from the Rocks team, Valentin and Chris. And then Snap, which is Sergio, and then our DevRel team, I wanted to quickly introduce Pedro, Alastair, Igor, I see in the call. We have a person from our field engineering team, Ethan, joining as well. And of course, our lovely speakers for today. If you don't know Canonical and of course what we do at Canonical, we are the publisher of Ubuntu. The OS that is uh, mo most known, like a Linux operating system that runs on public cloud workloads, as well as different uh, emerging uh, technologies and categories, such as smart gateways, self driving cars, and advanced robot. We also provide enterprise security support and services to different commercial users of Ubuntu. On the data solutions front, Canonical provides consulting support, security, and managed service for different uh, data technologies such as Postgres, MySQL, Apache Kafka, Spark, MongoDB, Kubeflow, MLO, MMMLflow, and of course, what we will be discussing today, which is OpenSearch. So to give you a bit of overview of today's agenda for the next slide, we have Sergio who will introduce SNAP, introduction benefits and how to be involved in the community. And then we have Mehdi who will showcase to you open search SNAP, how to get started. And then the next one will be Valentin who is the product manager at Canonical will uh, of course introduce Rock or like our OCI or container image for for at Canonical and how we do it. Um, he will introduce, give the overview of the benefits and how to get involved in the community. And of course, Mehdi again, to uh, help you get started with the open search rock. So let's start with uh, Sergio, virtual applause. <laughs> Hello. So yeah, I'm the engineering manager for StarCraft. Uh, a uh, funny name to encompass uh, Snapcraft, Rockcraft, and Charmcraft. So all the crafts, so it's hence Starcraft. And I'm gonna do a quick premiere on the, um, on Snapcraft, Snaps themselves. Uh, Michelle gonna be 10 minutes for this. So I'm gonna do a, a, 
essentially a, a, a quick run on 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 this story. But essentially, is why do we want to why why would you want to use Snaps or what what is the the thing that Snaps provides for for publishers in the first place? And one of one of the big important things is that it has it provides a direct relationship. Uh, um, for publishers towards consumers, which is not traditional in, in the Linux ecosystem where you would potentially uh, upload to uh, an Ubuntu archive, a Debian archive, or or, or um, uh, RPM a repository, and, and then the distro would take control of, of what you would have published and, and how you would update that. Contrary here, you essentially have a direct relationship um, towards your consumers, as you can see down there in the link that's circled in, in orange, where it says contact Sergio Espresso, that's myself. And, and I would be responsible for the start table snap that I have published in two different uh, risks that I've indicated. So there's a standard for indicating risk of stability for your users. And, and as you can see, I have a latest stable and the latest edge, and I'm in full control of that. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, another benefit is that you have, um, well, analytics for these uh, uh, the things you have updated. And as you can see, there's a smooth progress as soon as I release each color is, is a revision I have released into the into the store. And as I release these to the stable in this case, uh, I can see there's an uptick in, in the adoption of that uh, release. And you can see as well, there's a, a big slope in, in some purplish color there where it goes up and then it goes down. That's me essentially saying, well, that's uh, a publisher essentially releasing something to stable and saying, oh no, I made a mistake. And going back to the previous revision, um, whereas the, the consumers would then follow that trend of, of going to the, the reverted uh, revision of the snap. So in this case, what I also want to mention is that snaps um, that are published follow uh, revisions. So the clients actually go to the store and say, hey, these are the snap names I have, where do I need to be? Instead of having the client resolve uh, uh, doing some complex like version analysis, like what is the, like having the resolver to say, like, what do I need to download to, to bring the system up to date? Go to the next slide, please. Um, as you can see, as a publisher, there's a published status map here. And um, as I mentioned just now, uh, snaps follow revisions. That's the 98, 97, 100, 97 that you see in there. Um, I, for example, in that latest edge, I have one, uh, 100, uh, sorry. And then below, I have like all the things that, uh, revisions that are not published. So, or were once upon a time published or never published at all. So for example, to simulate that, that mistake I made, I could grab that 101 and, and put it on latest stable. And, and then anyone that, that is like operating would get that refresh, would get to 101 and then say, like, oh no, I made a mistake. I'll go back to 98, I'll put 98 back there and then you'll see the adoption go back to 98. Um, next slide, please. And then another thing that uh, Snap Spring, and this is would be uh, very common to anyone that uh, understands uh, container technology. It's pretty similar, except that it's a uh, much more uh, user uh, friendly in, in some ways. Um, so there's, um, in this case, uh, for the container technology underneath, everything is implemented using app armor set comp, kernel name spaces, and capability secrets and UDEV rules. Um, all this is managed by, by uh, a nice tagging system called interfaces which are descriptive to have like a desktop interface, uh, GSETIS interfaces, and these would be connected or disconnected. This is how we poke holes for confinement because snaps are confined by default. As you can see there, I have like the password manager service disabled uh, from, from my, um, or disconnected from, from or for the snap. So essentially that, that triggers in snap D some uh, policy that would disable or remove app armor rules um, um, that would allow me to talk to that password management service. Another level of trust is the concept of a verified publisher or a star developer. A verified publisher is an organization that usually goes through some vetoing. And a star developer follows the similar distro path. So if you want to be a Motu developer or a, a core dev on Ubuntu, you would essentially officially apply to, to some location and say, I want to be this. And there would be like this, this little council that says, okay, you can be or you cannot be one. You'd still need more work. This is very similar, and you would go to the forum, in this case, the Snapcraft forum, and announce yourself. And that's at the end of the slide here, my slide deck, which I'll show you later. Next slide, please. 
So now into how to create a, a snap, and this is where Snapcraft comes in. Um, so if you're a content creator, uh, but not uploading to Instagram, uh, images to Instagram, you would upload to the Snap Store. You would have to create like your Snapcraft YAML and run Snapcraft to eventually get your snap. Um, and uh, if anyone has worked on any packaging system, there are common things that are cross, uh, are sort of universal, like name, version, summary, description. This is essentially metadata and, and how to find your, your assets. Uh, there are a couple things in snaps that are um, a bit more um, lo lo local to the system, which is the grade. Uh, this could be grade stable, grade devel. Uh, this, these are guardrails essentially to not accidentally publish something that was meant only for development into some stable risk that I mentioned earlier. So it's a nice guardrail if, um, to avoid mistakes. Uh, confinement strict. There's another confinement called classic and dev mode which I'm not going to get into really much, but strict is applies to the confinement and it traces things I mentioned earlier. Oh. Base is, is essentially where the snap is going to operate on. Core 22 corresponds to Ubuntu 2204. Um, and, um, and also hints snap wrap work to build on so that you have essentially ABI compatibility. And architectures uh, is much more feature rich than what you see here, but architecture is essentially Snapper will try to build everything it can build on. So if I'm on the MD64 machine, it will only build on this MD64 target, but I can, that's a scalar value here, but it can be uh, a list and you can also build for a list or a scalar value. So in some ways you can define cross compilation. And if uh, you dispatch, um, this build to a much more complex system like a snapper slash build, uh, that that system can dispatch the builds of everywhere it can build on. So essentially you can have like multiple architectural builds. Next slide, please. So there's some metadata that's uh, application uh, domain specific. This is the application. This is how you essentially expose the application in, into the world. Um, and uh, the most important thing here to mention is essentially the plugs are, are, are those interface names are essentially what I'm, I'm allowing this snap to, to use. And those can be either connected or disconnected and there are uh, rules that uh, apply there. And then the last thing in, in, in the application specific uh, domain thing is the ex concept of extensions. This is uh, an extension called GNOME, which essentially hides complexity. Uh, so GNOME is 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 a, a large stack in in the Ubuntu desktop uh, world to create a, an application that targets GNOME. You need to know a lot about libraries and internals. But what this extension does essentially is only applies to the YAML. So you could potentially up expand extension and see the entire definition of how to create a GNOME app and uh, and then derive from that there and forget about the extension. Or you can keep using the extension as it were, but it's very transparent and what it exactly does. Can you go to the next slide, please? So now we have one minute, 17 seconds to finish. Okay, this is where the, the, the fun stuff happens. So parts is the brains of the operation here. Um, I essentially define parts. Those aren't friendly names like Darktable, OpenEXR, Open OSM, GPS map, or in this case, I have defined that my Darktable um, uh, part comes after open EXR and open OSM GPS map. Um, so as you can see there on the left, there's a graphic graph that shows part one, part N. So if part one were, part one were my dark table uh, snap, I would pull and build in an isolated, uh, so they would be independent. So pull will happen in some location, build will happen in some location. And then when I stage, that goes into the, in the common location for, for in this case, Darktable requires OpenEXR to happen uh, to build first. So what happens is there will be a part that's going to pull, build, and then stage. And OpenEXR is going to put all its development assets in that stage directory for which the Darktable part could access. Um, and then finally, oh, take your time. <laughs> I'm almost over. Uh, finally, um, since you have uh, development assets in your so my timer going up. If you have development assets in the um, stage um, uh, common location, there's a filter that you can apply to essentially finally prime your assets. And that is what becomes the snap. Next slide, please. And closing up, uh, 
I know this was very fast and lots of detail in a very quick uh, presentation. Um, you can find us on Mattermost. We're on, on, on that link there or on the forum, which is essentially discourse on forum snapraft.io. And that's essentially it. So on to you, Maggie. Uh, thanks, Sergio. So uh, my part is mainly about the uh, snap that we have provided, that we have built for uh, open source that we call uh, yeah, charmed open source. So the current features that the snap expose is the obvious install, start, auto restart of the open source daemon. Uh, changing of the admin user uh, password, initializing security uh, things, generating uh, self-signed TLS certificates, uh, initializing the security index, and so on. And finally, some test actions that we exposed to make sure that your open search installation succeeded. So there are a few uh, settings that uh, are required to be configured at the host level, so such as disabling swappiness or TCP retries to be set to five. And yeah, those are things that we will actually uh, showcase in this demo. Uh, so uh, the current snap that we have is on the candidate channel. We hope to release it soon uh, to the stable uh, channel. You can find the links uh, below. And I think with that, we can proceed uh, to the demo. All right. So uh, you can find the open source snap on uh, Snapcraft. So this is how it shows. We currently try to align with the upstream uh, version. So we are at 2.8.0. And you will find a bunch of uh, details in the space. Uh, as well as the GitHub repo, in case you're interested in more uh, details uh, on the snap and uh, yeah. So without further ado, I think it's time for the demo. So uh, yeah, so what I'm going to show is basically to install the open source snap, uh, configure uh, TLS, and finally have an open source uh, OneNote cluster up and running. Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, I'm going to install uh, the snap. So the reason I'm copying the command is that I do not want during this demo to be uh, making mistakes. So, all right, so uh, now that the snap has been uh, installed, what, what we'll do is essentially set the kernel uh, values. So uh, such as disabled swappiness and so on, those are required. So we set them. Afterwards, we are ready to, uh, to uh, configure open search and generate self-signed uh, certificates. So that's what we'll uh, be doing now. And here we basically run an action, an exposed action of open, the open search snap, which is the set of action, uh, a node name that we call CM0 for cluster manager uh, zero, uh, few roles, cluster manager data, and the private key password for the, the CI, the admin uh, certificate, and finally the nodes. So we do not differentiate between the HTTP or uh, transport uh, layer. So uh, we did that. And now what we're going to do is to start the actual uh, open source service. So we do it. Now our open search is uh, up and running. We are not there yet. What we'll do now is initialize the security index of uh, this single node cluster. So similarly, uh, this is an exposed action that we call security init. And we pass the uh, password of the uh, admin uh, certificate, of the key of the admin certificate. This under the hood essentially calls the security uh, admin script. It is initialized. Now we can we can try to uh, see if our deployment uh, succeeded. Those are test actions that we also expose. In this case, test cluster health green, uh, and there you go. So we see that we actually have a status green, and everything is working correctly. So if you wanted to do this manually, we have a few other uh, exposed action. 
but we could also uh, do it manually where we uh, copy the actual generated uh, node certificate and curl in uh, ourselves. So we can do that. And there you go. So we have the cluster name, open source cluster, green. Uh, yeah. And if we wanted to take a look at the node, there we have it, the named CM0 as uh, set previously. And that's it for the demo uh, of the snap. Moving on with the next section, if there are no questions, of course. Well, I'd, uh, just as an aside, I'd sure love, Nate here, by the way, I'd sure love to pick your brain on uh, uh, configuring security and generating your certs, uh, just as an aside, because uh, that's uh, some content I've been hoping to generate for some time, and so I, I could definitely use a resource there. Looks like you've uh, simplified it a little bit. Yeah, sure. We we can talk afterwards. If there are no questions, I'm uh, giving the stage to uh, Valentin. Thank you. <clears throat> so I have a few slides. So I'm just going to unfortunately ask you to to skip around them, but that should be fine. Um, I'm going to try to do it a bit higher level than what uh, Sergio did, but just keep in mind what Sergio said before about snaps, because a lot actually reapply to what we are doing here uh, with rocks that are uh, canonical approach to OCI images. Um, you're going to see why we are doing something different than what you can actually uh, find with, with Docker or Podman. Um, I think we have pretty good reasons to do it, and uh, I also think we have pretty good uh, solutions to that. So hopefully you should be convinced by the end. Um, this is just getting started. So there's a lot of, of gaps and things to close, but hopefully uh, this is a good audience to uh, to discuss this. Um, <laughs> I see Nathan, so uh, nothing at the, at the picture, the drawing. I actually love it. Uh, I usually um, showed the XKCD one, you know, where there's the whole infrastructure, modern infrastructure that uh, is almost falling because there's one component at the bottom that is uh, unmaintained or maintained by some uh, remote folk in, in Nebraska or something like this. Yeah. yeah. It's like a big Jenga tower and there's just yes. one little tiny, <laughs> tiny, you know, piece of software maintained by some hippie. It is. And, well, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a it's a great picture, but it's it's a bit sad because it's actually true. Uh and this one is sort of saying the same thing, but from another angle, uh, which I also think is very important and worth highlighting that is Basically, when, what you're doing when you're trying to build something valuable uh, that has a lot of, I would say, that is kind of high level or that has a lot of added value for the end user is you're aggregating a lot of software. Uh, you kind of have to, otherwise you would be reinventing the wheel on everything. So that's what you're doing. Um, and with containers, that's made super easy. You don't have to get it from one distro. You can pull things from basically everywhere, put them together, put them in an OCI image run it and it's supposed to be working on uh, any environment. So that that's amazing. Um, but there's also an issue with that is that while it looks super simple and pretty from the outside, like in the picture here, the truth is that it actually relies on a lot of things that are unseen or uh, at risk of being abandoned or unmaintained. And we want to avoid that or at least to have visibility on that. So if you go to the next slide, uh, Mehdi, what we are, doing to solve that is we are bringing two things together. Uh, the first one is tooling or a, a, a new technology, I would say, uh, that is rocks, rock craft that we're going to talk about. And the other thing is we are trying to build a community. You're going to see why we think this is uh, required for, for this to work. Uh, but first of all, yeah, rocks, what are, what are rocks? Why do we use this term? What do we mean with that? What we are trying to do here is do the software aggregation that you saw on the previous uh, slide in the right way to do it better than just have a few a set of instructions in a Docker file that is very close to what a bash script is to just pull software from the internet and hope that it's all going to, to go well in the future. Uh, so we're going to kind of make it predictable, make it be an exact science. And 
To do that, if you go to the next slide, uh, the main tool that we are pushing now and that we are using at Canonical to be uh, our images is what we called Rockcraft. Um, the rock name, just for the anecdote, uh, comes from an acronym, stupid acronym, saying Registry of Containers for Kubernetes or something like this. Uh, but we kept it because it, it, we, we think it actually is a great, uh, I mean, rock, right? It's, <laughs> it's a strong word. It's a powerful word that kind of says what we are trying to do, which is build a foundation, a very solid foundation that you can uh, build on top of to then deliver your software and actually focus on what you're building on top of the rock rather than focus on the rock itself. Uh, so to do that, uh, we have Rockcraft that is very close in the syntax and uh, concepts to Snapcraft and uh, that Sergio just presented. This is no, no, not random. Uh, this is just because this is exactly using the same code base and reusing the same principles, in fact. Um, and the reason for that is that there's something great. It's not that we love YAML uh, as a language. It's just that there's something great about it that forces you to be taking a declarative approach instead of saying, I want to do this step one and then this step two. Instead of doing that, you have to describe what you want in the end and not how you want it. Um, so obviously there are ways to accommodate uh, if you still have imperative needs, uh, that's always the case and it's good to have uh, workarounds. But the, the, the main idea is to be able to tell what you want in the end and then you have a machinery that is building it for you, getting pulling together all, all of the right components and uh, making sure you get it in a in a consistent and uh, what secure manner in the end. Um, so I, I wouldn't, wouldn't focus too much on, on the Rockcraft demo. I think uh, then Mehdi has a, a demonstration. But if you go to the next slide, um, I have a simpler version, I would say, of the the, the stages diagram that Sergio presented to you um, of, of what are the stages that the, the craft tools go through when they build software and in particular, I wanted to focus on the first one. Um, if you go to the next slide again, I, I kind of, I do a weird thing that I do animations with slides by just duplicating them. So I have a high number of slides. Uh, I did that because I wanted to focus on the pool uh, stage. I think all of them are very important, but Sergio went already into, into all of them. Uh, but the, the pool one is really what's interesting here because the, the real issue we have is that we are aggregating software that is coming from many places. And here we are, we are describing something that is very clean saying, we are first pulling whatever we need, and then we are building it, and then we are packing it, and then we are delivering it. The, the, we are pulling everything together. The fact that you are splitting it from the, the next stages, what it kind of gives you is it gives you an opportunity to assert uh, what, what, what you're pulling. Is it coming from sources you trust? Is it coming from places you authorized? Um, to trace what's happening, uh, so to keep to keep a log of everything you did, which is kind of the SBOM approach. But here you can see that you don't actually have to build uh, the the asset to, like the rock or the OCI image to to know what went in, into it. Like you just can look at the the recipe and you basically have your SBOM. So then we can convert it using a, a standard that people would be able to reuse. But yeah, you, you're not trying to figure out after the fact what you did. You know it beforehand. And the last thing is, um, it's something we're working on at the moment. So obviously, if you use it right now, it's not going to be exactly working as we would love it to be. Uh, but that's what it permits you is to have reversibility or reproducibility, sorry, or uh, we like to say rebuildability because that's kind of different. But the, the idea is that in the future, if you take this uh, recipe for an OCI image, you would always be able to rebuild it. And this is super important. Uh, there are big advantages of reprodu reproducibility in terms of trust, but there's also big advantages in terms of what happens uh, in X years when the project gets discontinued or people have moved on to something else than OCI images, and you still need to be able to maintain what's running on, on for your project or what you're distributing to, to end users. So we think that this part is really the most important and the one we want to, to focus on. Um, if you go to the next one, the this one is for the, the second part uh yeah this one is a good one <laughs> uh it, it's focusing more on the community so the first part is we have the tooling the second part what i want to say here is that when you're building a rock ideally that's kind of the vision it's all building of course you have to start somewhere uh, but you're not just building one thing standalone that you're going to distribute in in the wild you're building something that is part of something bigger 
And this is basically uh, the Ubuntu story uh, that is very close to our, our hearts at Canonical. Um, is that th this is what is the most valuable. It's not really the packaging format. It's not really the way you're building it. It's the fact that we are all maintaining these together, focusing on the parts that we like or have interest in. But in the end, this is all shipping as a, as a big thing. Um, or we are bigger than what we are uh, alone, I would say. If you go to the next slide, I, I tried to explain a bit better what I mean with that. Um, is that basically that's the way we started. That's the way everyone started when they built uh, containers. They took VMs, uh, they took OS images, and they just shipped it respecting the OCI standard or uh, the Docker V1 standard at the time. And uh, that was working, that was good, uh, but it was uh, very bad from a best practice uh, perspective. I mean, even though it's easy to use familiar and uh, fits kind of all purposes, it doesn't scale well. It doesn't do well at microservices. It's, it's, uh, I would say, a liability even even, even if it's well maintained. It's sometimes seen as a liability because uh, you have a lot of components there that can bring in vulnerabilities that actually don't matter uh, to your use case. So then, uh, if you go to the next slide, what happened without us because Canonical wasn't really in the OCI images game at the time. Uh, is that people started creating images that were a lot smaller, like Alpine, like Distroless, uh, trying to, to reduce the risk. And uh, the, the problem with that is that it, it was a lot harder to use, a lot inconsistent. And uh, well, we, are, we are looking at this when we entered the OCI game and thinking, what can we do that doesn't destroy Ubuntu, but at the same time addresses like there's a clear need to have smaller images instead of shipping just the whole distro. So if you get to the next one, the, the aim that we have now is to basically do what Ubuntu is for servers and hosts, but for containers, saying we're going to ship a lot of containers. Uh, we are going to enable people who want to distribute their software to ship containers that work well together, that are all consistent, that reuse things uh, across all of them, um, so that if I do something here, everyone else is going to benefit from what I'm doing. I mean, this is a big, hard task that we are trying to, to address here, but I, I think we can do it. Uh, if you go to the next uh, slide, I think also the reason we can do it is, uh, well, basically because what we're enabling here is we're enabling people to be selfish by, by, not, by building together, which is a bit counterintuitive. But the idea is really like, instead of focusing on all these dependencies that you don't want to focus on, Using Rockcraft and Rocks, eventually you would be able to just focus on your application and don't really care about what's happening uh, be behind the scenes. And if you go to the last one uh, that is just here for design, but uh, <laughs> this one is just to give a shout out to um, and to celebrate the community and the work that we already see starting. Uh, the open search Rock obviously is coming from a team at Canonical, but still I think it's a great uh, first contribution uh, to with the great software that people care about to to rocks and of course this is going to evolve uh with, with time and with, this is going to grow and i think that's all i wanted to share with you because now uh Mehdi has some much more concrete things to show you thank you Valentin. uh i think now uh I will basically chain uh, if there are no questions for Valentin. Okay, doesn't sound like it. So uh, I'm just going to show you what we've built for uh, open search, the rock that we built for uh, open search. Uh, so uh, currently the rock is the, the OCI image is hosted on uh, GFCR. Uh, this is the current uh, status. We're planning to move it to uh, Docker Hub, and you can find the repo in uh, these links. So you can find also a README. We try to describe a, a little use case to, to play with, and the release versions, uh, you can find them on, on GitHub. Uh, similarly, on GitHub, uh, if you go here. Yeah, so uh, I think the goal of this demo is to show you how to uh, naively uh, create a three nodes uh, cluster. 
uh, naively and uh, manually for that matter. So moving back for uh, to my terminal, uh, I could not unfortunately pull the image because I was sharing my screen. So uh, please, uh, yeah, bear with me a bit. Hopefully the network is good. All right. So Docker. Yeah, we have it. So uh, what, what I'm going to start with is uh, creating a single node a cluster, uh, a single node, sorry. So the goal, just as a reminder, is to create a three nodes cluster. So I'm going to start with the first node. Uh, the first node, we have a few environment variables that we expose, so such as node name, uh, similarly to the snap uh, demo, the first node will be uh, CM0, as in cluster manager zero, initial CM nodes uh, CM0, and we will expose it to the port uh, 9200. So uh, we do that, and we should have a container uh, running. So uh, now what we'll be doing is uh, getting the IP address of this specific node, because we will use it uh, when registering a new node. So we get this, uh, just, and there you go. Okay, so now we'll create a second node for this uh, cluster that we're trying to build. And you will see that there are a few differences. So we will call this node uh, data one, as in this is a data only node. As you will see, it has a few node roles, data and voting only. And as seed hosts, the previous IP address that we had stored in container zero IP. And here we'll expose it at 9,201, the port. So we have the second container uh, running similarly let's get the ip address of this of this one and let's uh deploy the third and uh latest node so this one will be uh node name cm1 seed hosts container zero ip zero, one ip and initial cm nodes which is the initial cluster manager nodes, uh, CM0 that we previously uh, deployed, and CM1, the current one. This one will expose at 9,202. 9, so theoretically, we should have now a three nodes cluster uh, that's up and running. So let's take a look and verify that this is working. So uh we're just simply uh curling here and there you go so three nodes uh two cluster manager uh, manager and data and the other one with data and voting uh only with the name cm0 and cm1 and uh data one so you will notice that this is uh this does not use uh, tls and that's right, because we currently uh, only use this OCI. We rely on the on our charms to actually configure TLS uh, in the deployments. So, yeah, under the hood, could be interesting to know that this OCI uh, image is relying on the snap, meaning that we get the binaries of OpenSearch from the previous from the snap that we previously uh, presented. And I think that's it from my side. I think we're up for questions from the community, if there's any, for both Snap and Rocks. Hi, guys. Uh, you're you're going to have to forgive some of my ignorance here. Uh, and we are running short. Uh, I'll try to keep my question brief. But uh, so it, So if I understand this correctly, Rock is kind of like snap but it's for oci images and so like instead of local dependencies that it resolves and builds for you this would like using rocks would be on like a a, a cloud provider or 
on a like an EC2 instance? So th there's uh, some truth and some uh, things that I probably made unclear. <laughs> <laughs> the, I would say that, that OCI, well, OCI containers and snaps are kind of similar initially. That's that's where is the similarity mostly. And we we have a tool that enables you to build OCI images that is raw craft that is very close to how Snapcraft uh, works. But once you have your OCI that is built, it's just an OCI like any any other OCI. It just has some very consistent parameters. If you were building another rock, so all rocks would have a lot of things in common, especially on how you uh, instantiate and use them. Because um, you're pretty free with the OCI standard, especially with regard like to the entry point, you know, like when you want to configure like environment variables and this kind of stuff, uh, you're pretty free with the, the OCI standard. We're trying to make that more, I would say, opinionated just so that it's, it's very consistent across all these images. Uh, but yeah, in the end, it's just an OCI images, uh, just OCI images, so you can very much use them like you would do uh, anywhere else. But yeah, at, awesome. at build time, though, just to clarify something else, <laughs> at build time, uh, when it's pulling resources, it, it's pulling, well, depending on what you specify, but it, it, it's pulling them from uh, um, Ubuntu repositories for what's Debs. Uh, then you can specify if you want source to build from source. I think that's probably what you did with the open search one. Uh, yep. So. Gotcha. It's just so the, the end result for both of them is a, a Docker container. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Wait, no, no, it's not a Docker container. It's a, and one's a snap and the other is a Docker container. Um, so Snapcraft builds snaps and uh, Rockcraft builds OCI images. The recipes, let's say, to create these assets have similar uh, rules or the same rules for the building aspect. And the, the application domain specific things in, in Rocks would be the services entry and in, in Snaps would be the application entry or where they defer and, this, and the packaging format itself in those images. You create layers and then bundle them into one big thing with additional metadata. And then uh, <clears throat> The snap world is a squash fs file system with metadata. Gotcha. The thing is that in the parts definition, you can use, as Mehdi's showing there, snaps as an input for your, your parts. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions for our uh, guests here? Awesome. Well, I sure appreciate uh, Canonical coming and sharing their, their work with us. Uh, it, it, uh, any anything that gets more people using open search and making it more available and more malleable for the public's needs. Uh, I, I'm behind you guys 100% on this. Uh, looks like good stuff. And, you know, I'm, I've always been a bit of an Ubuntu fanboy myself. So uh, you're, you're among friends here and we, we really do appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you so much, Nate. Thanks, Valentin, Sergio, and Mehdi. I am going to take back over the screen share. Oh, and that's it. Well, this is us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and our developer relations is uh, myself and the amazing Mr. Tippett. Or just David, you know, I, I don't know if you have a preference. It's okay. Well, I'm starting to go by tippy bits. Tippy bit. Oh, I like that even better. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks all. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, uh, it's still not too late to register for Open Search Con 2023 at the Grand Sheraton. Register for Open Search Con. I, I, I do hereby command it. <laughs> do it now while you're thinking about it. Thank you, yeah, friends. Michael. We'll have this video available as soon as possible, too. I was just thinking, you know, uh, where do bad rainbows go? Well, they go to prism. It's a real light sentence, and it gives them time to reflect. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was awesome, Nate. <laughs> a two-parter, you up your game. Yeah, well, I, I crib my <laughs> jokes from Reddit, so, you know. Forgive me there. Everyone, don't forget Ubuntu Summit's coming up this year as uh, well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Put a link yes, to the yes. blog announcement in there. Uh, yeah, did you want to pitch real quick, Michelle? 
Yeah. Yeah, Ubuntu Summit. I think it will be on um, this November. So we hope to see you there. I'm sending the link for those who are still in the call. Please, the CFP is still open. I think sometime uh, end of July. So please submit your papers. All thank right. You. Well, I have nothing else for the good of the order. Chris, did you have anything? No, thank you all. This was fantastic. Indeed. Thank you all. Bye.